So today we're going to be delving into this uh, topic, Islam and Christianity. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to give you some a brief, um, brief history of what I have gathered, like statistics. I, this is just based on United Kingdom. And I just wanted to just share with you to know what's going on right now. I have been getting this information that um, in Britain right now, um, I want to say the um, Muslim mayors, um, mayor of London, mayor of Birmingham, mayor of Leeds, mayor of Blackburn, uh, mayor of, um, just hold on a second, I think it ran away. <laughs> Um, all right, we're here. Mayor of uh, Blackburn, Mayor of Sheffield, Mayor of Oxford, Mayor of Luton, Mayor of Oldham, and Mayor of Rockdale. This is in England, right? All these mayors are Muslims. They have over 3,000 Muslim mosques in England. They have over 130 Muslim Sharia courts in England. They have over 50 Muslim Sharia councils. They have uh, the no-go areas, Muslims only, no-go areas in the UK. They also have 78% of their women who don't go to work. They are on free benefits and housing. They have 63% of their men also who are on free benefits and housing. And they, they are saying Muslim families, six to eight children. They are planning to go on free benefits and housing too. Now all the schools, in the UK, they are supposed to be, they are now they've been mandated to serve halal meat. So all this was achieved by just 4 million Muslims out of the 66 million population of the British people. 66 million British people and the Muslims, 4 million. And this is the impact they have made. This is an eye opening to you guys. Turkey is the present day Europe, right? And partly in Asia. Apostle Paul was a citizen of Turkey because Tarsus exists in Turkey. Christianity existed in Turkey for about 1,023 years. Can you imagine? Christianity existed, that's in Europe, right? 1,023 years. While Christianity now exists in Ghana and Nigeria for, it's only existed for 172 years. I uh, don't know how accurate this is. I'm not sure about this one. I'll skip that one in me. Then the seven churches that we were reading in the book of Revelation, Ephesus, Mina, Pegmam, Tiatara, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, they all exist in old Turkey, all of them, which is Europe. Turkey was once the largest Christian auditorium in Europe called Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Constantinople. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was taken to Turkey, meaning that Mary was taken to Europe by Apostle John. You remember Jesus on the cross? He told Apostle John to say, here is your mother, uh, you know, mother, here is your son. So given that uh, connotation from Jesus, he took Mary uh, to um, Turkey. And up to now, her room has become a tourist center. 
Turkey today has now 96% Muslims and zero point, the, the new Turkey and 0.02% Christians. That's less than 130,000 Christians. So the Hagia Sophia, which was once the largest in uh, Europe was taken over by the Muslims and converted to a mosque for over 400 years and later used as an Islamic museum. I just wanna highlight why Christianity collapsed in Turkey. And this is something we got to watch out for if believers we don't really unite and pay attention, we are likely to see this happening right here where we are. I can see it happening, happening, happening. Uh, number one, there was so much emphasis on doctrinal differences which weakened the Turkish church. Churches kept on fighting doctrinal. Oh, in our church, we Holy Communion is not taken like this. Here, the church is like this. Here, we don't do this. You know, doctrinal differences. Number two, rivals, 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 rivals among its denominations. What do you call this word? Rivals. Come on, somebody help me. Rival, rivalries, rivals. Rivals. Rivals? Silent Arab? Rivalry. 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 I think somebody else? Rivalry. Rivalry. R-I-E-S. Rivalries. 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 Rivalry. is silent, right? Yeah, that's all. I'm laughing at us. What's the word? <laughs> it's rivalry. Rivalries. Yeah. So we ignore yeah. the L. So there's no the L. Rivalries. Yeah. Huh? The right? L is silent, kind of. Kind rivalries. Of, yeah. Now we understood you, Pastor. Okay. The L is silent, I guess, rivalries whatever you call it, among its denominations. So that's friction, fighting, tug of war, churches fighting, always fighting each other. The enemy has succeeded in destroying churches because of this enmity. Oh, you, you don't go to, uh, don't go to that church, don't go to that church. Enmity has caused uh, denominations, uh, church to end up closing. Petty politics in churches coupled with ethnic biases is one of the reasons. Those who did church history, I think you agree with me. These are major issues that have affected Christianity. Even up to this day, we believe in the Holy Spirit or we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Oh, in this church, we are only doing this. We only do it this way. Oh, God. And then the, the fourth one, major one, is that the Turks were building big cathedrals instead of building men, focusing on building cathedrals instead of building men. God loves people more than he loves our own buildings. So the spiritual foundation of Turkey is stronger uh, than other this other nations, I just want to give you just a glance, a small glance, a small glance here. I'm not going to dwell there. I'll give you three facts here. The spiritual foundation of Turkey is stronger than that of Nigeria, Ghana, and Christianity existed for over a thousand years. Like I said, in Turkey, unlike ours, which is just, that's the saying, say 172 years, but Islam radicalism uprooted Christianity that existed for thousands of years. If it happened in Turkey, guys, it can also happen here. That's why we have the menace, Boko Haram, which is, which is destroying churches in Niger Northern Nigeria. And it may take 200 years to evangelize these guys. So there is a secret agenda to just Islamize Nigeria and other African nations is contained in Abuja Declaration of 1989. So we are saying to you, don't say 
it cannot happen. It can surely happen to those in Zimbabwe who remember we had it, uh, I think last year when Minister of Education was forcing that it be co-opted in, in curriculum, I uh, think about a year or two years ago, and parents had to rise and fight against it. So it can happen. So we need to be aware and we need to pray about it. This is why it's very important to understand what we are talking about today. Um, this thing sometimes, uh, Christianity and Islam is sometimes irreconcilable. A Muslim is a person whose religion is Islam. Islam denies that Jesus is the son of God and that he is the savior of mankind. That being the case, um, they are lost. However, we preach to them in love without telling that to their faces that they are lost. Even though they call all non-Muslims and Christ, uh, uh, Christ uh, like people infidels, we are not infidels. We are children of God. We are people of the way, amen. So what follows in this uh, section, uh, what I've just said will perhaps surprise you, but I would like you to know that Allah of the Quran is not the Jehovah of the Bible. Yep, mm -hmm. I know some of you are like, what pastor, what? Yeah, yeah, it, it's different. The Allah of the Quran is not the same of the Jehovah of the Bible. It is not the same. Uh, I'm going to be presenting some evidence, um, the unsettling facts that I may want to highlight to you. I know some of them, you, you might have heard this, but this unsettling fact is that Muslims are set for eternal condemnation unless they believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. They must believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the son of God, and that God raised him from the dead. But the Quran teaches them uh, to deny this eternal and saving truth to their damnation. So this is something that is like a time bomb. So they also claim that Allah is just the Arabic name for God, whom Christians call Jehovah. They say Allah is creator of all, sustainer of all, and the upholder of all the one who created man, the beneficent and the merciful. Uh, since Jehovah is also all of these things, they also believe that, um, that the world has been created by him. So they have been deceived to accept that Allah is the Lord, the God, the Jehovah of the Bible. So this premise is false. Um, you know, Allah hopes to be like God and yes, through Islam has subbed the place, position and prerogatives of Jehovah God as the king eternal, immortal, invisible, um, the only wise God to whom all glory uh, belongs forever and ever, according to 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. But to be like God and to usurp his, his rightful uh, position is God over all has always been Satan's number one ambition and the chief reason for his original fall. You remember Isaiah 14 verse 12 to 15. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did is to weaken the nations for thou hast had said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, number one. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit upon the mount, uh, upon, the upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number four, number five, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Number six, I, no, number five, I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to yell to the sides of the pit. 
this is the four that we all know. So now if we find one called Allah claiming to be what God is yet denying the very fundamental claims that God makes, and if we find that he is acting in the very same manner that Lucifer in Isaiah 14, this is 12 to 15 did, we can only conclude that the claim is none other than Lucifer going by an Arabic name, right? So I wanna to present to you the evidence that Allah of the Quran is not Jehovah of the Bible. Um, if you are writing in your notes, write it in capital letters, Allah of the Quran is not Jehovah of the Bible, it's, that's not him. Capitalize it, okay? So I will also be picking up some Quranic verses and uh, that are to be de depicted. And you can also go Google and find the Quran and you can find those verses. You can download some of the Quran, I think, for free online. So the Quran differs with the Bible on the sonship, number one, the sonship, Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the son of God. They say he is a prophet. So Allah of the Quran is depicted as a solitary being who does not have a son, nor did he begat one. Here is what the Quran says. The first verse is Surah 9, verse 30. Surah 9, S-U-R-A-H. Uh -huh. When people with clean minds. Where is everybody today? Are people here? Everybody's face is closed except for- Yes, for we are. We are frustrated to be in class where people are closing their faces. We are here, but we are yeah. here. Thanks, Tonde. Thanks, Ose, for accompanying me. All right. Yeah. So, Surah 9, verse 30, that says the Jews call Uzziah. Uzziah, that's Ezra, right? U Z A Y R A. -A. So, you can write that verse, Surah 9, S U R A H. Those are um, the verses found from the Quran, 9 30, right? So it, it says the Jews call Ezra or Uzziah a son of God, and the Christians call Christ the son of God. That is a saying from their mouth. In this, but they imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say, Allah's cares be on them. How they are deluded, how they are deluded, how they are deluded away from the truth. This is from Yusuf's, uh, Yusuf Ali's translation. If you download, you can uh, download that version, Yusuf Ali's translation for that. Then verse 31, Surah 9, verse 31, they take their priests and their anchorites to be their lords in derogation, in derogation of Allah. And they take their Lord Christ, the son of Mary, yet they were commanded to worship but one God. There is no God but he. And then on verse five, Surah 9, verse 35, it is not befitting to the majesty of Allah that he should be a son. Glory be to him when he determines a matter. He only says to it, be and it is. Then uh, Surah 23, verse 91. No son did Allah begat, nor is there any God along with him. If there were many gods, behold, each God would have taken away that he had created and some would have loaded it over others. Glory to Allah, he is free from the sort of things they attribute to him. So the Quran describes Christians as people who must be cursed by Allah because they say Jesus is the son of God and regard him as their master. We read that in Surah 9, verse 30 to 31. But Jehovah, the God of the Bible, is only is an only begotten son called Jesus Christ. John 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
So your argument, when you are going to differentiate, when people ask you the question, so what's the difference between Christianity and, uh, and Islam? Islam, number one is that they don't accept that Jesus Christ is the son of God. That's your number one argument. And you quote those scriptures and you show them those scriptures in Matthew 3 verse 17 and Matthew 17 verse 5, God calls Jesus his beloved son. Um, so you need to have those, those ones, Matthew 18 and uh, Matthew 17 verse 5. And you also want to highlight to them Mark 14 verse 60 to 62 when the high priest was asking Jesus at his trial whether he was the son of God or not. Jesus replied saying that he was the son of God. So Mark 14, verse 60 to 62, he is standing before the high priest. And also Jesus is clearly identified as God's son in many other New Testament passages. Uh, Matthew 8, verse 29, uh, 14, verse 33, Matthew 16, verse 16, John 1, verse 18. And not only that, I have taught you about um, um, about, uh, what do you call it? Um, about uh, the, that Jesus Christ is highlighted from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I have told you, I've taught you that class. If you don't uh, remember, go back to our notes, especially to those who are doing evangelism, the deity of Christ, go and get that uh, um, recording. I'm sure Tonde, we still have that recording about the deity of Christ from the Old Testament coming to the New Testament. I revealed on every, every, every page, uh, Genesis, Exodus, until Revelation. And I managed to bring out Christ from all those uh, books. I pointed who Christ is from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So please, you need to understand the deity of Christ so that you are able to defend your faith. So the Quran differs with the Bible on the deity of Jesus Christ. Since Jesus is not the son of God, according to Allah, Muhammad and the Quran, then he is not God, right? So Surah 5, verse 72, they do bless him, they say, they do bless him who say Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. But said Christ, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord, and your Lord. Whoever jobs other gods with Allah, Allah will forbid him the garden, and the fire will be his boat, his abode. There will be the wrongdoers, be no one to help. I mean, you can understand it's Arabic to English, so it's kind of, but you can understand the sense of it. Jesus is but a messenger to them like other messages sent from God and not mere a son of God. We know that Jesus is not a mere messenger. So Surah 4, verse 171, Surah 4, verse 171, it says, all people of the book commit no excess in your religion, no, no say of Allah about but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of Allah and his word, which he bestowed on Mary and a spirit proceeding from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers. Say not Trinity desist. So in other ways, they are telling you openly here that they, don't, they are rejecting the doctrine of Trinity, the three in one. You see, the, 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 the Quran rejects the doctrine of Trinity. That's what we saw uh, on verse 75. Um, Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. His mother was a woman of truth. Uh, they had both to eat their daily food. See how Allah doth make his signs clear to them, yet see in what ways they are deluded away from the truth. So this is written in Surah 5, verse 75, Surah 43, verse 59, verse 63, and verse 54. 
64 of Surah. So the Bible teaches that Jesus himself was God. First Timothy 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed in the world, received up into the glory. That is John chapter 1, this one. First Timothy 3, verse 16. Romans 10, verse 9. And then we go on to Isaiah 9, verse 6 as well. That talks about the child is born and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Matthew 1, verse 21. Matthew 1, verse 23, John 5, verse 18. Um, it is also alleged by Muslims that Jesus discounted divinity, number two. They believe that he discounted divinity and, equi and he equalized himself, the equality with God when he called God his God and when he rebuked a certain ruler for calling him good master. John 20, verse, um, verse 17. Uh, and Luke 18, verse 19. Why do you call me good? No one is good, save one that is God. But in the first instance, no discounting of divinity is intended in the words of Jesus to Mary Magdalene when he told her, go unto my brethren, unto my brethren and say unto them, unto them, I ascend unto my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. What is seen here is not inferiority, but submission. As the son of God on earth, Jesus submits to his father in heaven. And by so doing, he is teaching this great lesson to all his followers. That is submission is not inferiority, is sin in Jesus forgiving people's sins. Something that is exclusive and the prerogative of God. Mark chapter 2, verses 5 to 12. Luke chapter 7, verses 48 to 50. John 8, verses 10 to 11. Um, we also see receiving the worship of men. Jesus received the worship of men. Again, something that is prerogative to God, Matthew 8, verses 1 to 2. is evidence that Jesus received worship. Only gods receive worship. In the second instance, Jesus also uh, called himself good. He says, no one is good save one. That is God. He was not saying that he himself wasn't good or that he was not God. Actually, the opposite was true. Jesus was saying to the certain ruler that no man is good except God. He was saying to the ruler, do not take me to be good if you do not accept that I'm God. For none is good except he is God. So Jesus was saying, I'm good because I am God. Right? Number three, the Quran denies the Bible's account of the death of Jesus by crucifixion. So Muhammad and the Quran claim that Jesus was not crucified nor died, but to the people it was made to appear so. Surah 4, verse 157, it says that they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge but only conjecture to follow for a surety they killed him not. So Muslims are told that when the Jews sought to crucify Jesus, called Isa, they call him Isa in the Quran. Jesus, they call him Isa, right? God caught him up to heaven and threw his likeness on someone else who was crucified by mistake in his place. 
So I, I just feel like this is so strange, something that you can actually laugh at, to say that Jesus was caught up in heaven and then he was uh, thrown on this earth and that he, his image fell upon someone else. I find like this is really ridiculous. So the denial of the death or, uh, of Jesus by crucifixion to atone for the sin of mankind effectively shuts out all Muslims from salvation and eternal life. The Bible says that Jesus died for our sins by crucifixion, that he was buried um, and that he was raised upon the third day. So believing this brings salvation and eternal life to nothing. Matthew 27, this is 32 to 44. Luke chapter 23, this is 33 to 43. 1 Corinthians 15, this is 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 22. So in fact, the Bible teaches that salvation is found in no one else apart from Jesus Christ, which is Acts chapter 4, verse 12. He only is the way. Jesus is the truth only. Jesus is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, verse 6. Nobody comes to the Father except, except through Christ Jesus. So he that believes on the Son of God is everlasting life. And he that does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him, according to John 3, verse 36. So God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son of God has life. Amen. Has life, but he who does not have the son of God does not have life. Says to John 5, verse 11 to 12. So Islam shuts out men from Christ and consequently Muslims cannot be saved and cannot have eternal life. John 3, verse 18. Can somebody just read that one for me? John chapter 3, verse 18. Who wants to read that one? John 3, verse 18. I can look for it first and read it. John 3, 18. Sorry about that. John 3, verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. There you go. So by rejecting Christ as the only savior of men, who by his death atoned for the sin of men and who by his resurrection made it possible for men to have their sins forgiven and justified before God. Already the Muslims have neither access to God or fellowship with him. John 5, verse 23, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which is sent him. Who is on John 5, verse 23? Can somebody read for me John 5, verse 23? Again. John chapter 5. Quiet. That all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Right. Simple and straightforward. Number four, the Quran differs with the Bible on the creation of man. <laughs> yeah. So the, it records the words of Gabriel that Allah created men from a, a clot of blood, from a clot of blood. Can you imagine? <laughs> I was laughing. In the first place, where did the clot of blood come from? <laughs> Come on, people, show your faces. Let's laugh together. Ah, this is a boring class. I hate such a class where you've got to be laughing by yourself as a teacher. Everyone's face is closed. Come on. Guys, open those faces, man. You are making my visit. to open their faces because you keep on closing your faces. Let's laugh together. 
They say it from a a blood clot. Seriously? Where did the clot (laughs) come from? (laughs) It's actually in their Bible, so in their Quran. So it's in Surah 96, verse 1 to 3. It says, proclaim or read in the name of uh, thy Lord and cherisher who created, created men out of a mere clot of congealed blood. Proclaim and thy Lord is most bountiful. Right? Mm-hmm. So you, 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 you are a clot of blood. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I said <laughs> that we are strange. I mean, it's weird <laughs> that we really were a clot of blood. <laughs> We came from a clot of blood. <laughs> Where did it come from in the first place? <laughs> so I'm just showing you some of the crazy things, you know, just to think about. These are crazy stuff. <laughs> just to think about how does that work? So the first five verses of Surah are supposed to be the first revelation received by Muhammad from Ali. So it boggles the mind. <laughs> Why? Surah is placed somewhere near the end of the Quran instead of being the first surah. This is order at its best, right? Such an arrangement, of course, defies logic. So a later surah, which must be where the earlier one is, but is allotted the 23rd position, revises or modifies the account of man's creation. This could possibly have been necessitated by Muhammad's later awareness that his early account of man's creation differed in a great way from the biblical account of the same, right? So according to the modified account, uh, man was created from wet earth, then dropped a sperm uh, uh, (laughs) or a seed in a place of rest. Then Allah made the sperm or seed into a clot of congealed blood. Then the clot was turned into a fetus lamp. (laughs) Then on the little lamp, Allah fashioned bones of the bones of the flesh, on the flesh. Then Allah developed out of this contraption another creature. This may sound like a pathetic attempt at scientific fiction writing, but this is laid down in their Quran. Surah 23, verse 12 to 14. (laughs) <laughs> it's actually there. They have written it down. They have evidence from their own scriptures. So Surah chapter 23, this is 12 to 14. Men we did create from a quintessence of clay. Then we placed him as a drop of sperm in a place of rest, firmly fixed. Then we made the sperm into a clot of congealed blood. Then of that clot, we made a fetus or lamp bones and clothed the bones with flesh. Then we developed out of it another creature. So blessed be Allah, the best to create. I don't know what you make of this verse, but it's just crazy. So the account of the creation of men so differs with that of the Bible that this cannot be one in the same God speaking. So the Bible's account of creation is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So so my, my number five point, the Quran is inaccurate accounts of the Old Testament incidents, right? So the Jews of Medina, and elsewhere refused to accept the Quran as the word of God because of its inaccurate and contradictory accounts of the Old Testament incidents. For instance, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is is mistaken for Miriam, the sister of Moses, and Aaron, Surah 19, verse 27 to 29. And Haman, whom the Quran says was an officer of uh, Pharaoh, was actually a top official of King Ahasuerus of Persia. Surah chapter 40, verse 36 to 37, with Esther 3, verse 1, comparing the two of them. And number six, the message of the Quran is dramatic, diametrically 
opposed to the message of the Bible. So I will give you some instances uh, in confirming this fact. First, Allah or Quran encourages Muslims to wage war against the disbelievers and believers or what they call infidels for the purpose of destroying them if they persist in their unbelief or in sin, sparing them if they accept Islam. Thus, we see that Islam at first spread their religion forcefully by the point of the sword. Surah 8, verse 12 to 17, verse 39, and verse 65, uh, Surah 9, verse 29. So without deceit, the sword, Islam was, uh, would have been uh, still born or it would, be, it would have died in the cradle. So in the Bible, we do not see Jehovah enforcing religion by the point of the sword. Jesus commissioned his disciples to go and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In Mark 16, verse 15 to 16, no instant punishment will be administered by the disciples of Christ to those who choose to shun the gospel of Christ. So the judgment of the unbelievers would be delivered by Jehovah God on the day of judgment when they would be damned. Acts 17, verse 30 to 31, Hebrews 10, verse 26 to 27. Second, the Quran promises good Muslims a paradise, the description of which hinges on the immoral. Muslims who will be admitted into paradise who spent eternity drinking themselves drunk with wine, served in goblets, and reclining on soft seats. Their sexual appetites shall be quenched by an unlimited supply of maidens of paradise of which the Muslims will marry as many as they like. This sounds like maligning a religion, but we have a, re a record of this in Quran. I mean, <laughs> you know, when you read it, you are only laughing. It makes no sense. <laughs> You know, that, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I mean, I just find it ridiculous. <laughs> Reading, that is going to be like paradise if they live their life well on this earth. This shall be their paradise. They'll have so many wives, you know, they'll be drinking and uh, uh, wedding and dining and having fun. That's what they will be doing. So that's Surah 44, this 51 to 54, lo, those who kept their duty will be in a place secure amid gardens and water springs attired in silk and silk embroidery facing one another. Even so, it will be, and we shall wed them unto fair ones with wide lovely eyes. <laughs> I mean, so ladies, if you want, <laughs> I don't know, but it's just ridiculous. Um, so they shall have beautiful women, beautiful eyes shall be saved. So those who are ugly, what will go when they go to? <laughs> if you don't have eyes like that as a woman, what are you going to do when you die? So <laughs> you're going to go to your So I, I don't know, it's just funny, <laughs> the whole thing. So you can also find this in um, Surah 55. This is 46 to 78, uh, Surah 56. This is one to 41, chapter two, verse 25, Surah three, verse 14 to 15. So the Bible's description of the hereafter is so different to that of the Quran that we conclude that the revelation that came to Muhammad originated from a different source than the one from the biblical revelation was derived. Quranic revelation came from Allah and biblical revelation came from Jehovah God through his Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 to 17, 2 Peter 1 verse 19 to 21. So the unbridgeable chasm that lies between the Quran and the Bible exists not because the Jews falsified the scriptures, but because Allah is not the God of the Bible. Number seven, Allah and Jehovah cannot be one and the same God as their characters are diametrically 
opposed to each other. So the Quran depicts Allah as a very nasty God who can stoop so low as to employ deceit in his affairs with men. Consider these surahs, okay? Surah 4, verse 1, Surah 4, verse 142. Lord, the hypocrites seek to beguile Allah, but it is he who beguiled them. When they stand up to worship, they perform it languidly and to be seen of men and are mindful of Allah, but little, right? This is from Kanom. If you are looking at Surah, you can use what we call picked hole. Picked or P I C K T H A L L translation. Picked horse translation is the one that is so clear on that one. So, according to this surah, Allah employs deceit in dealing with hypocrites. He stoops so low to swindle, to cheat, or to mislead. This is what is meant by the word beguile, right? Allah also sends calamities to those who reject Islam. Surah 74, verse 11 to 17. It says, leave me alone to deal with the creature whom I've created, bear and alone, to whom I granted resources in abundance and sons to be by his side, to whom I made life smooth and comfortable, yet is greedy that I should aid yet more by no means, for to our signs he has been refractory. Soon I'll visit him with a mount of calamities. This is still the old Abdullah Yusuf's translation. So Allah shall cast disbelievers or unbelievers in hell, where they shall toil and be weary, drinking boiling water. They'll be... <laughs> they'll be... <laughs> okay, so they'll be drinking boiling water and uh, eating bitter thorn fruits, which shall not satiate their hunger. That's Surah 88, this is one to seven. So Allah's only interest in unbelievers, is, that is pagans, Christians and Jews are going to be tormented in hell. Surah 98 verse six, it says, Law, those who are unbelievers among the people of the scripture and the idolaters who abide in fire of hell. They are waste of created beings. So no Christians don't worship a God like that, right? So Allah, the God of Muslims is not Jehovah. Their characters are so different. They cannot be remotely considered to be one in the same God. Allah hates all non-Muslims. The God of the Bible hates sin, not sinners. Romans 5 verse 8 is proof but God com commended his love toward us in that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for us because we, we were Christians, but yet to die for sinners. We still have a lot of sinners up to this day who still refuse to accept Christ Jesus, but all the same he died for them. If they make a decision to accept him tomorrow, they will still be believers and make it to heaven. He died for every sinner. So to be a Christian means to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple of Christ. So the Bible describes Christians as the sons of God in John 1 verse 12. Therefore, any manifestation of hatred toward Christians is a manifestation and a demonstration of hatred toward the God of the Bible and toward the Jesus Christ in the Bible. So Islam and the Christian faith, these are two irreconcilable religions. What I'm going to, to explain is that I want you to uh, know that um, most Christians, because they have not had the opportunity to read the Quran and the Bible, they end up accepting that the Bible and the Quran are saying the same thing, but they don't say the same thing. I gave you so many pointers. They don't accept that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He is a messenger or another prophet like any other prophet. But the Bible clearly highlights Jesus is the son of the living God from Genesis to Revelation number two. 
the Quran differs with the Bible in the deity of Christ. It differs, right? They don't accept that he speaks as a God. He is not a God as far as they are concerned. So they do not accept the description or any word that highlight or points that uh, Jesus Christ is God or is the son of God. Uh, as we are talking every time, when you mention to them, you are supposed to talk like he is a prophet. Number three, they deny the Bible's account of his death, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. They deny that he was not crucified. It did not happen. He wasn't uh, crucified. He did not die. They believe that he went to heaven when they were about to crucify him. He was caught up in heaven and he exchanged his body and gave his image to someone to be crucified on the cross like him. I don't know what philosophy that is. Number four, the Quran differs with the Bible on the creation of men. I don't know who was a clot of blood, who was created from the clot of blood. The Bible does not say that. Uh, and the, like I said to you, there's also a contradiction when he tries to, to correct it into another version. That is number five. The, the Quran is in accuracy accounts of the Old Testament incidences. They caught the wrong things from the Old Testament. Number six, the message of the Quran is diametrically opposed to the Bible message. So we see right away through our, those scriptures that it's, it's contrary, it's contradictory. It's, it's not even aligning in any way. It does not even align with the Bible, what they are saying. Number seven, Allah and Jehovah cannot be one and the same God as their characters are diametrically opposed to each other. This one wants to kill, but this one says we will not kill. We want you to be saved first. But if you don't accept this truth when you die, then you shall die eternal life, eternal death. So that's where another point that we see how things are different here. So uh, I'll give you highlight some of the facts about Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. So now that I've highlighted those seven things, I'm going to talk about Muhammad a bit. So concerning the tenets of Christianity, Muhammad did a very superficial and erroneous uh, knowledge. He, an example of this is his knowledge of Trinity, which he conceived of consisting of God, um, the Virgin Mary, and Jesus Christ, who is the child. Uh, we see that in Surah chapter 4, verse 171. Surah chapter 5, verse 116. This is hardly surprising as biblical Christianity had been almost extinguished, replaced by a false brand of Christianity called Roman Catholicism. So in his early life, Muhammad was favorably disposed to Christians as to Jews, Surah 5, verse 82. But in his later life in Medina, his attitude to Christianity deteriorated, Surah 9, verse 29. So Muhammad was confused. Gabriel with the Holy Spirit was confused. Gabriel or the Holy Spirit. So you called Gabriel the Holy Spirit. Surah 9, uh, 2, verse 97. And Surah 26, verse uh, 193. So after the death of Khadija, Muhammad married several wives. Khadija, Khadija was uh, his wife, okay? First wife. So Muhammad was married in case... <laughs> in case you don't know that, he was married. So after his first wife uh, died, Muhammad uh, married several wives, including the divorced wife of his adopted son in defiance of uh, Arab custom. So his Muslim followers granted him the right to these indulgences because Muhammad claimed that Allah had given him that right. So it's written in Surah 33, verse 37, Surah and verse 38, and verse 50 and verse 51. 
So we see that Muhammad's indulgence in moral weaknesses were justified by a revelation of the worst convenient kind. And anybody who would blame the prophet for being immoral would be cursed in this life or killed and be doomed by Allah in the next life. Surah 33, verse uh, 37. Let me talk briefly about the sacred book of Islam, the Quran and the Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H, the sacred books of Islam, the Quran and the Hadith. Here is what you need to know about the Quran, Islam's most important book. Number one, the Quran was compiled into a book after the death of Muhammad under the directorship of Abu Bakr. Those who knew the weight of the Quran by heart helped them uh, with the compilation. Number two, during the caliphate, what they call the caliphate of Utamni, uh, caliphate, the C-A-L-I-P-H-E-T-E of Utman, U-T-H-M-A-N, all existing copies of surahs were called in and a new version was met and it was declared an authoritative version. So it was based on Abu Bakr's collection as well as the testimony of those who knew the words of the Quran by heart. After Uthman's version of the Quran was compiled, he ordered all variant versions to be destroyed. So the Quran as we have today was compiled in 650 during the caliphate of Uthman. This was 18 years after the death of Muhammad. I think number three, Muslims claim that the order and form of the Quran today is the same order and form of the Quran as it was compiled during the caliphate of Atman. Muslim scholars admit that the arrangement of the surahs is not easy to comprehend. A clever way of saying the arrangement is confusing, right? So it is admitted by Muslim scholars that revelation uh, given to Muhammad of various deaths and on different um, uh, subjects can be found lumped together in one surah. So some of the Medina surahs, that is revelations, that Muhammad did in Medina are found in Meccan surahs, though they are of later, uh, of later revelation. So the very early Meccan surahs are found at the end of the Quran, where obviously the Medina surahs ought to be found. I talked about the Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H, is next in importance to the Quran. Here is what you need to know about this book, the Hadith. So the hadith or tradition contains the sunnah or examples of the prophets, right? Of the prophet Muhammad. So the book is a record of Muhammad's life and activities and of the early Muslim communities. So Muslims believe that the hadith was inspired uh, by Allah, just as the Quran was inspired. So the most reverent collection of hadith was compiled in a topical arrangement by Bukhari. So the Sunnah sets forth the example which all Muslims should be following today, right? So apart from Bukhari, the Sunnah was recorded by Ishak, Muslim in Tabari, Islam's most trusted scholars. So the Quran and Sunnah have combined to form the Sharia law, right? So I want you to understand when you talk about the Sharia law, what you're talking about. So let me talk about the five pillars of Islam. Five pillars of Islam. So central to Islamic faith is adherence to the five pillars of Islam. According to Islam, Muhammad received these five pillars of the Islamic religion from Allah when he ascended to heaven at one time. So the five pillars are number one, Shahada, Shahada, S-H-A-D-A, -A, or the confession of faith, which says there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Every Muslim must take this confession every single day of their life. Number two, Salat, which means prayer. 
S A L A T, Salat. So Muslims pray five times daily at daybreak, noon, mid afternoon, after sunset, and early in the night. How many times do you pray as a Christian or a believer? How many times do you pray? Then number three, swaum, swam, swaum, or what they call fasting, S-W-A-U-M, or what they call fasting. During the month of Ramadan, Muslims must not eat or drink, smoke or have sexual relation, relations between dawn and sunset. So that, this is what they call most of you. If you heard about Ramadan, that's the time they are praying and fasting. Number four, zakat or almsgiving. Muslims must give two and a half percent of their income and their kinds of property to charity every year. Then number five is the haji. Haji or pilgrimage. A Muslim is required to go to the Kaaba or, or Mecca. It is in Mecca. Kaaba is in Mecca. At least once in his lifetime, every Muslim. Okay, let's talk about their beliefs. Okay. So Muslim theology called Tawid, Tawid, T-A-W-H-I-D, defines that all a Muslim should believe while the law, Sharia, prescribes everything that he should do. A Muslim must believe in God, which is Allah, his messenger, Muhammad, his angels, his book, Quran, and Hadith, and in the last day. So four archangels are acknowledged by, by name in Islam. Number one, Jibril or Gabriel. So this is the message of revelation who is confused with the Holy Spirit. Mikhail or Michael, the guardian of the Jews. Israfil, the summoner to resurrection. And Israel, the messenger of death. So the Sharia, the Sharia law embraces every detail of human life from the prohibition of crime to the use of the toothpick and from the organization of the state to the most sacred intimacies or unsavory aberrations of family life. So Muslims also believe in the existence of the jinn, which is the equivalent of biblical demons. They were created of smokeless flame. However, such beliefs predates uh, Islam. The jinn possesses human beings. In Arabia, all poets and soothsayers were thought to have been possessed by the jinn. So they are good, they, they, they are good and bad jinns. They are good demons and bad demons in Islam. They teach that jinn are created species that are capable of both belief and unbelief, and that Muhammad was sent to the jinn as well as to men. So good demons perform all the religious duties of Muslim. Surah 72 verse 1. So the disbelieving or the unbelieving jinns or demons who are often called Afarit Shayatin. Ifrit, I-F, there's Afarit, A-F-A-R-I-T, Shayatin, S-H-A-Y-A-T-I-N. And then there's Ifrit, I-F-R-I-T, Shayatin, right? With S-H-A-T-A-N. The other one is T-I-N. This one is T-A-N for singular. So T-I-N is plural, and then T-A-N is singular. We're expelled from the first three heavens when Jesus was born. And out of the last four, when Muhammad was born. So they still, however, if drops in the lowest heaven, where they occasionally pass on information to human magicians, but they are chased away by angels of shooting star if they are observed. So that's in Surah chapter 72, verse 1 to 9. 
So the devil is regarded as a fallen angel. Um, they call him a, a fallen angel uh, or jinn who disobeyed God. Jinn who disobeyed God's command and to all angels to, uh, to do homage to Adam. Muslims, eschatology is a curious hodgepodge, guys, <laughs> of Jews. So Christianity and animistic legends and folklore, the, the last day of the, what they call the resurrection and the judgment figures prominently in Jewish thought uh, is passed on into Islamic beliefs. So according to Islamic eschatology, all men will be raised, the box will be opened, and God is judge, will weigh each man's deeds and balances. Some will be admitted to paradise, where they will recline on soft couches, coughing some cups of wine, handed them by the Yuris, which are the maidens of paradise, of whom each man may marry as many as he pleases. I gave you those scriptures. So here are other pertinent things you should just know. So many customs erroneously attributed to the Islamic religion are actually the customs long practiced by Ari in Arabia by the Arabs and predate the religion of Islam. So one such custom in Islam is renaming convicts by giving them new Arabic names. Although such names like Yusuf, Musa, Ali, Muhammad, Abu Bakr, uh, Abdullah, Abdullahi, Abdullah, Ayesha, Fatima, Rashid, Akbar, Iman, Hussein, Sadiq, Yazid, Yunis, Jamil, and many others erroneous uh, uh, stated to be Islamic names. They are actually Arabic names. These names existed in Arabia before the advent of Muhammad in Islam. If you've ever heard those names. Number two, annual pilgrimages to the Kaaba in Mecca by Muslims did not originate with Islam. The annual pilgrimages predated Islam by many years. So in pre-Islamic times, Arabs made annual pilgrimages to the Kaaba in Mecca to worship their idols. So Islam possessed the Kaaba, cleansed it of its idols and made it the house of Allah. So the annual pilgrimages to Kaaba in Mecca continued under Islam in Allah because the object, because of the object of worship. I want to end there today. I will talk next week about Muhammad's successors and the sects of Islam. I don't want to bombard your brains today. I think this is enough for the day. So let's talk, guys. Let's talk about this. Are you, were you a clot? A blood of thoughts. <laughs> come on, guys. Let's talk about this. Where did you come from? <laughs> okay, let's have some conversation. Do you have comments? Do you have any? I have a comment. Um, based on what you, this was very, um, very, very great, Pastor. Thank you so much, because I. Have been, I wanted to invite a friend on, but maybe it's good I didn't um, because this is really something that a lot of people believe that Allah and Jehovah are the same. And I think this was really, really great how you broke it down. So thank you. Um, just a comment based on a lot of what you read, I felt like there's a lot of chauvinistic um, things in the Quran um, that speak to paradise for to men and um, knowing some of the Muslim culture, having Muslim since that the case um, and women are just kind of left to just whatever. <laughs> but Seven kings. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Paradise. <laughs> five, six wives, because I know men with five, six wives and it's it's a disaster, but that's another story. But um. In any event, I just thank God because as we know God from, of the Bible, he makes sure that he loves us all the same men and women and that um, going on to the next life that he has for us in heaven 
It's a place where everybody, no more tears, you know. So I just really, I just really love, um, as we, I've heard you talk about it, how fair God is and how much he loves us equally and how he just, he's just a good father. And I just hope that, you know, this is a great opportunity as being part of the evangelism team to use this knowledge tomorrow at the church and on the team. So I just thank you for what you shared today. But that was just my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. Yes, go ahead. So that's the, I, I mean, like, just listening to what you're saying, it just feels like some of the uh, stuff from the Muslim religion is just so unrealistic and out of touch with things. I mean, I'm not to just be disrespectful, but it's just, yeah. Like, even like when you were talking about it, I was just like, what? Not only the clot, even the, the whole beautiful women. So, like, I mean, so what happens to the rest? It's just, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. That's all I can say. And the comparisons that they try to have, and they are just the misinterpretation of information. That's, yeah, when you talked about the Holy Trinity and how they have it, the conception that they have, it's just, yeah, mind boggling. Yeah. The good thing is that we are not saying these things out of our minds. We are actually reading from their book and compare it to our Bible. So, Pastor, may I have a question? Mm -hmm. um, like you, you said, um, Allah wages war against um, uh, people who are non Muslims, right? And um, the difference between Allah and, and you were talking, I think the difference between Allah and, and Jehovah that Allah hates people who are non Muslims and wages war, encourages Muslims to wage war against non um, uh, non Muslims. And God loves, uh, I mean, God hates sin, uh, does not hate uh, people because uh, God loved us. Wouldn't there be an argument that um, this is like uh, in terms of judgment, like let's say, you know, God will destroy those people that would have, um, like let's say during um, tribulation or, or, or you know judgment when we are all judged that if if you refused Christ you're going to be judged by that that you refused Christ and, and, and you, you go to hell or you know you go to heaven would they not be the same argument that this is in the end not now no it will never look like that because it's happening if you say you love Jesus now we'll cut off your head right now it's not in the end time. It's happening right now. Boko Haram is now. Taliban's are now. Uh, the what do you call it? The uh, ISIS is right now. Right now, if you say you sin by saying you love Jesus, it's not going to wait for you at the end of life, like what the Bible says. It's going to be now. Yet the Bible says God He does not love the death of a sinner. So you wait for you to make your own decision and to make your own choice to accept Christ as the son of man until the final day. If you choose not to, by the end of the, uh, of the world, as he says, when he cre recreates this earth and the world and the heavens, then that's your fate. And it's right there. It's entirely up to an individual to make a decision to say, yes, I wanna follow Christ or I don't. Even if you refuse, even if someone, you go to someone, you preach to someone right now, and they say, I don't want you, Jesus. You walk away, do you do anything? No. Do you? <laughs> I don't know if, if there are Christians anyway who kill or do anything, I don't think so. But we don't do that. But they cut your head off right away. Right there, you receive your punishment. Any other question? I just want to say, Pastor, thank you. This was so this was, this was very powerful and enlightening. And to think that in college I once took a class on uh, world religions, and from that class, I, what I had taken out was that uh, 
No, they teach you that uh, Christianity and Muslim, they name them as like the Abrahamic religions and you learn it like from that. But this distinction of saying that Jehovah is not Allah and seeing how they, their characters are different and how they make it, how they has been very like, and even in the state of I think that's also like, very, uh, there was noise there. Yeah. And uh, another thing that I have is, um, you know, like the the revelation on uh, on the on their like on the heaven is it, very kind of like what you say, like uh, the drinking and the wives and like okay, what what's going to happen, you know? So it's like it's almost like okay, if they are not doing all these things now, then all of a sudden after they go to heaven, then they can start doing them. So it's like. <laughs> It, it, it doesn't add up uh, like that. And yeah, and um, I think the other thing was like what we started out with about like why Christianity collapsed in Turkey. Uh, you know, when Christianity had existed over a thousand years in Turkey. And you know, all the all the reasons that you that you listed up, you know, like the four reasons, you know, the doctrinal differences, uh, the rivalries, you know, the petty politics and like, you know, focusing on building cathedrals and big churches and everything rather, you know, those are the things that are happening like even right now. And uh, yeah, and, and, and I think it's something that we need to watch out for is uh, present day believers mm -hmm. that we don't fall into the same trip. And, you know, even when you say like Nigeria and Ghana, Christianity has been there for like, you know, like maybe close to like 170 years. And you look at a place, you know, that, is, that was like established for like over a thousand years falling like that, what mm -hmm. more? You know, so we still have like a long way uh, to go. Yeah. Like, you're right, you're right. And, you know, look at how much right now, how the churches are fighting, how we are putting down each other. These are charlatans, these are that. You know, this is that. And I'm like, okay, so, but the Bible says, you know, these signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. Where are they? Where are we going to see? Them? So everyone who does miracles, signs and wonders is a charlatan. Come on, church. <laughs> God still perform miracles. We still have to cast out demons. We still have to heal the sick. We still have to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. But look at the fight. Look at the battle of the church, the doctrine, you know, the politics, it's just sad. And you wonder where are we going honestly as a church? So yeah. Oh, yeah. Another I thing, just you. like, um, we when are in we danger. Were talking about, sorry. When you were talking about the, the statistics in, in England, really, it, it, I think yeah, another country that they said in 20 years time, majority will be Muslims is Belgium. And the reason why is because of the immigration, you know, how you, we, we are taking, America is taking on all, all these Im immigrants from Middle East. Yeah. And there, there, there's, I think there's another part in the Quran which says if you cannot fight, whatever land you step in, you take, you take control of it, mm -hmm. either by sword or by numbers. And that's what they do. Even here, that's what they do. They will, ha they have more children, like, a, a, an average Muslim family is five children, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I mean, yeah. even like a, <laughs> where I work in the hospital, I see it. They come in to have the seventh, eighth, ninth child. Yet um, Christians or other races, we two. only have two. Mm -hmm. At most, if you see a family of four, that's a big family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in Belgium, what they're doing is having those more children. They marry early and they have more children. Yet the, the Belgians themselves, they only have one or two children. Mm -hmm. So by numbers, in 20 years, there will be more than yes, the Belgians themselves. It's happening not only in the UK, here in America, it's already happening. If you really go to the statistics, go and look at it. Right here, go to Minneapolis. I worked, <laughs> I worked for the sisters and we were doing the immigration and refugees. All of them, it's just them. The schools were invaded by second learning English, just them, thousands of them coming in every month. So it's a tough one. Yeah, turn the quiet. Okay, um, thank you, Pastor. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I I I just wasn't sure because I'm in the car driving. So uh, I just wanted to 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 make a comment as well. So like just like uh, yeah, I also took like two classes in college about Islam, and they used to teach us, you know, like oh, you know, when you look at these terrorists, they call them extremists. They are people who don't do what the Quran says. They don't do what because the Quran does not incite violence. But from what we have just you know, like taught us today, it actually shows that the Quran actually uh, incites violence because all these people, what they want to do, these terrorists, that they want to convert everybody the whole world to Muslims. So actually, the terrorists might actually be, be uh, you know, like uh, uh, practicing the Quran more than those people who are saying that we are, they, are, they, are, they are Muslims, they are not, you know, uh, 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 violent. So I thought that was like really, you know, uh, eye opening because like I mean when you look when you look like in the education system, they are teaching like Islam is this sweet, nice religion that is so close to Christianity, but it's definitely not. It is definitely not. It's very, very different. And I think that's why so many people are being deceived, uh, because of this, you know, like um thing. and then the other uh, thing to that I just wanted to make a comment i hope i'm not right uh, i'm not wrong about this but i think you have to, when you're talking about uh jesus christ when he's talking about you know the like the submission when you think that he wasn't uh, referring to himself to as god but he was just talking about submission i think you have also made a comment in the past about you know sometimes when we, we read the bible we have to be careful about when jesus christ is speaking as jesus which is the son of man or when he's speaking as Christ, which is the Son of God. So, like, uh, I just thought, you know, you know, I, I mean, that might also be a point for us when we are reading the Bible to, to kind of understand, you know, uh, when is Jesus Christ speaking as the Son of God and when is he speaking as the Son of Man. Right, right. That's true. That's true. Thank you, Tont. It's a very good uh, uh, analysis right there to know that we have Jesus the body born on this earth, and we have Christ, who is the Son of God. That's a very good one for us to keep in mind. Anyone else with a comment who wants to say anything or wants to ask? First, I have a quick question. When you talk about Mohammed being confused about the Trinity, whom, whom did they have uh, in, in his uh, trinity? Jesus, Mary, and God. And isn't that similar to what we talked about, you know, on the case of like Semiramisi and... Uh, yeah, that's, I'm going to go, I'm, connect, I'm going to connect it. <laughs> yeah, that's it, that's it. I'll connect uh, in the near future. <laughs> I, I, I pass that. Right, oh, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much for teaching us this. And I, I was also thinking about the same thing that you just said here. Yeah? And um, the, the other thing that, uh, that where I raised my eyebrows as well is that um, it all seems like some of these religions, like, you know, Islam, as we're talking about today, it's like direct uh, opposition to Christianity. So it's like someone who is, fed up with something that happened in Christianity and then they build like this premise of how to debunk um, you know Christian values and you know the ethos like the Trinity like we're talking about right now and when you exactly when you talked about the um, when you talked about uh, the Trinity it in my mind it rang a bell about Semiramis and Tammuz and Nimrod exactly as well so that uh, I found that very interesting as well. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's one of those things. I, 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 I will touch on the issue of Isaac and um, um, what's his name? And Ishmael. I will touch on that one. Trust me, and um, I will explain. And I will also touch on the issue of um, Abraham, the father, and some of those things that happened there. Yeah. It will be very helpful to understand all those things. And the good thing is when you talk to them, you are not just talking out of your head. You have evidence from their own book. Right. <laughs> yeah.
Anyone else with a comment or we done today for today? I had a quick question, Pastor. Their pillars, their five pillars of Islam, what are they trying to compare to? Because again, it seems like everything is um, supposed to be some sort of comparison. That's supposed to be like the um, Ten Commandments. I mean, I know it's five and ten, but I was just trying to figure out what that um, was in matching to with the with the Bible. I don't think we have anything like that, uh, like to say the scripture like this. But uh, I don't know where in the Bible where it says you must pray five times a day. I don't know. I've never seen. Yeah, and I was say is just pray without ceasing. Every hour, be praying every yeah. hour. That's yeah. what you're supposed yeah. to do as believers. Yeah. Do it five yeah. times a day. But yeah. it's pray every time, every now and then. Be in the spirit, just connect, remain connected in the praying mood. Every hour, let your spirit be praying. Stay connected. Mm -hmm. Not five times a day as such, but unfortunately as believers, we only um, pray when we wake up in the morning, if at all we get that time to pray. Otherwise, we only pray when we come to this prayer line, you know, when uh, Tony is leading, and somebody's face is closed and they are doing their dishes and saying, amen. That is whatever they are hearing what Tunde is saying. <laughs> yeah, this thing, this Zoom and these lights, they are not good for prayer. <laughs> you only have three people sometimes praying with you who are really there. The rest of the people, they're not. But anyway, anyhow, we are here. We thank God for the grace. All right. Anything else? I think we should be done for today. No, Pastor, I just wanted to say thank you for the enlightenment that you gave us. I think like most college students, um, I also took a class. But I, I took a world religions class. I think I did take, um, I think one of the classes that I took that we had the majority of Muslims was Judeo Christian, is it Judeo Christianity? Something along those lines. And um, I do remember we had a lot of Muslims in class. I also had a, like a lot of Muslim friends who would, who would swear up and down, no, we are just the same, Christianity, we're all the same. Even the professors, they believe the same thing. Like, you know, oh no, professors, you know, Christianity, we're just the same. We believe in the same God. It's just that, you know, uh, Jesus was a, was, was a prophet and we don't believe he's the son of God instead of Mohammed. But I guess in, in, in reading what we're reading, including even, I think you did touch uh, a little bit about even their version of the afterlife, uh, you know, uh, exa for example, you know, how they go to hell, you know, where we know that in the Bible, when you, you know, we know that once, once everything is done and once everything passes away, those who are bad were, are going to be thrown in the lake of fire. And the only thing that we know about the Bible, about the lake of fire, is you're going to burn. It doesn't say anything about drinking boiling water. It doesn't say anything about sweeping the floors or <laughs> anything of that sort. <laughs> so I think, I, I thought that was funny when you did point that out because um, I think it's something that we really, uh, we're afraid to discuss with other, you know, with, with other Muslims. But I think, uh, thank you for enlightening us because as some of us will be going out to evangelize on tomorrow, I believe that we kind of have a leg to stand on. And I believe as we continue to uh, read this book, sorry, as we continue to do this topic, that leg will turn into two legs, which we can walk on. So thank you for that. Yes, Nash, thank you. We're not going to be drinking some hot water. <laughs> There's some thorns there. I don't think that's biblical. I don't, I don't know. I've never seen anything in the Bible that says we shall be drinking hot water in hell because there's not going to be water. Remember the story of the uh, poor man Lazarus and the rich man divers, if you remember. You know, the rich man ever says, Abraham, just tell Lazarus to dip his finger in the water to, to, to put on my tongue because I'm burning here. And then 
Father Abraham tells him that, oh, I'm sorry, this is not gonna work. Hmm. Well, let's close tonight.